All right, let's begin. It's, uh, it's about time, and we like to start promptly here. Um, I want to welcome you to the last in our lecture series tonight. And as you see, we don't, as you know, we don't have a lecture, an individual lecture, but rather a panel discussion with all of the lecturers who have uh, spoken to us before. And they're going to be moderated by Professor Ashby Kinch, who talked to you at the very beginning and introduced the series way back when. So uh, first of all, remember, turn off your cell phones. Um, and I know, I, I never think of it either. And, um, and then I'll, I'll make my usual announcements. Uh, uh, remember that at the end of tonight's event, we will be going down the hall to the 300 rooms, down through those uh, double doors, to have some wine and cheese and a visit with all of our lecturers. So I think that's going to be a whole, whole lot of fun. It's always a good way to end the series. Um, Angela has asked me to make a couple of announcements here. So first of all, there will be DVDs of the series available, $10 per set, and these will be available only after the MCAT broadcast of all of this, uh, all of this series has taken place. And there will be pre-orders during the reception later on. You can fill out those order forms down in the, uh, in the reception room. Now, the series will be broadcast on MCAT channel 189 beginning Tuesday, April the 12th at 6 p.m. So here's how it goes. The first lecture, Anya's, will be broadcast at 6 p.m. On, on Tuesday, April the 12th and will be repeated on Saturday at 8.30, the following Saturday at 8.30. The following Tuesday, the sec second lecture will take up and be repeated on Saturday and so on. And once that whole series is complete, the DVDs will be available to you. So um, just um, um, order those for tonight and then we'll get them to you as soon as we can. Um, some of you were interested in a reading list from Professor Ha's um, lecture a couple of weeks ago and we have a reading list which he's brought for us so they'll be available in the reception room and they're also out on the front desk. Um, I think that's it, except to say that we're always eager to find out what your ideas are for subsequent years. Uh, I do want, uh, in that connection, to introduce the members of the advisory council of this community lecture series. It's a great group of people with whom to work. I'm on that council, Jeff Badnock. Would you stand up, Jeff? Um, Jeff Badnock um, and Boone and sometimes comes kind of late to the series because she flies away to somewhere. And welcome, Chris Comer, Dean Chris Comer from Humanities and Sciences. Don Hobby, Don's been off in Hawaii too, but uh, he's back. Look, he's so relaxed he can hardly stand up. Um, Ashby Kinch is a member of our committee. And also, I already mentioned, uh, if I haven't, uh, Kitty Robbins. Would you stand up, please, Kitty? So let's give uh, a, a round of applause to these folks. And we are the folks who will like your ideas about what's going to happen in the coming year. So we'll be collecting those from you at the reception and giving you some contact information so that you can send it in to us later on. All right, so actually I think that's all I'm doing for tonight, uh, since that's all I know about tonight, except that Ashby Kinch is organizing the, uh, the panel. So let's just turn it over to Ashby and get started. Thanks. Can you hear me? Is that loud enough? Good. I'm going to roam a little bit. I don't like to stand still too long. Thank you so much for coming uh, to the last event. Um, when the, the lecture series committee asked me and Anya to come talk to them about putting together a humanities panel, um, 
and we had our first lunch about it, I, I you know, immediately had a, a group of people in mind, and I just have to say I'm, I'm so happy uh, the way that the whole panel turned out. I mean, it's just such a wonderful collection of scholars. I know I've been inspired by going uh, to each of these lectures. I knew about some of the work of my colleagues, uh, but I didn't know all of it, and I hadn't heard it in, in the synthetic forms that I heard, and so it's, it's really been wonderful for me, and I'm, I'm sure for you as well. Um, for the panel, we thought we would, um, yeah, I've, I've given them a couple panel uh, questions, which each of them are going to speak to in a second. And I think um, because some of you probably haven't attended every one, I'm not going to summarize the lectures, but I thought it would, I would give some impressions from my perspective um, as a working humanist. I might have heard the lectures with a slightly different ear uh, than some of you did. Um, I, one thing that really jumped out at me is methodology. Um, I, I love the stories we heard about um, the, the contingent accidental fact that just popped out of nowhere, the book that appeared, um, the work and labor that comes uh, with doing the kinds of research that we do. Um, so with Anya's work, for example, uh, the expectant waiting for that package to come when it, you know, it's got all the letters that you know you need. Um, I'm a medievalist and I spent a lot of time in archives in Europe. And uh, I can tell you the waiting, you know, you, one of the things you have to do as a humanist, you have to cultivate patience. You have to be w able to stretch your time out uh, and, and let something unfold over long, long stretches of time. Um, and I, I thought uh, in particular with, with her work, um, that sense of getting to know intimately a figure uh, who's, you know, long dead, but has left this imprint on paper. Um, and you can see it in the handwriting and, and the, uh, the, you know, in my field, manuscripts, that discipline is called paleography. And over time, you kind of get to know the, the fine quirks of a script. And you have that sense, a kind of kinetic sense that you're connecting with the human on the other end of it. And so that was something that really jumped out at me um, about uh, Anya's work. Um, I, I can relate with Benedict as well, the fish out of water experience that she told us, uh, the story about being at a, um, at a conference, a, a symposium over multiple days with a, a period of, uh, with a, a group of vegans and having to kind of come to grips. I'm here, I am doing animal studies, but I eat animals. So all these other people are so much more politically committed than I am, what does that mean? And I can relate to that moment. I think a lot of uh, humanists have had that moment where they sort of feel on the edge of, a, of something and they have to work out their position. They have to work out their relationship to uh, the, the material. Um, so it kind of brings into stark relief the kind of human component behind the work that we do. We have to make decisions uh, and follow through with them. Um, for David's talk, it was something really simple, and I, I think those of you who attended it, you might have had this response as, as well. It's an enormously complicated subject, justice, a lot of layers and nuances, but we were treated to a beautiful, simple graphic, right? Liberty, equality, fraternity. And that simple graphic, uh, it, it, rather than being simplistic, isn't quite complex, but it's taken David years of reading and massaging, developing distinctions, subtleties, nuances to distill that problem down to that simple graphic, which we now have the gift of carrying around in our heads um, to help us organize an incredibly complicated uh, topic in kind of one simple graphical form. With Kwan's work, it, it's part of this uh, accident of history question. You know, a female doctor working in Vietnam dies. Uh, by gunshot uh, on the battlefield, holding her diary. Everything about the image is so powerful and gut-wrenching and evocative. And by all rights, that diary should have just literally melted into the dirt of history. But by this weird contingency, a translator picks it up, reads it, and says, this is a keeper. This is something valuable. And it sits there undigested for years and years and years, decades, literally. And now it's so powerfully woven into our hearts and minds and into Kwan's work. And so there's, there's something powerful about that sort of contingent moment um, that you can't predict and you don't know where it's going to head uh, down the line. And then finally, Jillian's talk on empathy. Um, it's rooted in hours and hours and hours of the trials and tribulations of the theater, all of the missteps, all of the misspoken lines, all the missed cues, um, all the painstaking labor that accumulates eventually into a theatrical practice that yields that magical moment on stage. But then also all the human hours, not just with the actors, but with um, the, the people, the humans that she's interacted with through her work, both the, the war uh, survivors, the veterans, and also the refugees that she's been working with uh, recently. And they, they yield this very idiosyncratic, unique voice to us. 
um, which she is privileged enough to be a, a conduit for. And it, that, that last talk in, in particular got me thinking about how humanistic work kind of works along this continuum between the highly idiosyncratic and unique, um, paying witness and, and paying homage to those unique aspects of human life that are irreducible, that make life worth living for each of us as individuals. Um, but then also open us up to the experience of another person. And then far, far on the other end of that are the paradigmatic structures of thought. Um, and so, so, you know, Quan's work and, and Anya's work uh, and Jillian's work opened us up to these voices that are unique and idiosyncratic and specific, but they're grounded in paradigms of history and culture that, that their work is excavating. And on the flip side, David and Benedict presented us these big paradigms uh, justice and shame in the face of, uh, of the animal other. Big paradigmatic ideas that help us organize our, our thoughts, but also help shape how we can think about individual moments. And they both uh, stand in a particular place. You know, they both occupy a very specific contingent moment for themselves. Uh, and that they are lenses through which that paradigm is then, uh, you know, brought uh, to our attention. Um, so anyway, I want to thank them and I want you to help me join in thanking them again for the work they've presented uh, this last five weeks. Um, as Linda mentioned last week, um, we do have uh, a new initiative, a new proposal. Uh, uh, several people here, Linda and Anya and Chris Comer and Jenny McNulty and I, and I don't know if anyone else, Paul Dietrich, Paul Lauren, um, dozens others around uh, campus have been working on over two to three year period, four years, depending on where you start the calendar. Uh, but uh, we're hoping that the Humanities Institute will be um, you know, officially validated by the Board of Regents this year, and it'll come to fruition. And through that process, Anya and I have had a lot of conversations uh, in small groups and uh, just the two of us about you know, what we wanted to see uh, in that institute what kinds of values we wanted to see its mission um, you know, put forth to the world, and what kinds of activities we wanted to see it uh, um, host and sponsor. Um, so because of that, I've been thinking a lot about the, the two questions that I, that I posed to the panelists, and here they are. I'm going to ask them each to just talk for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to open the floor up uh, to questions. The first question is, what's the most pressing issue facing the humanities in contemporary American culture? And what possible solutions do you see to address that issue? Simple question, right? Not, no big deal. And the uh, second one is uh, more exciting, I think, probably. What's the most promising and exciting new development in your field or in the humanities more general? More generally, excuse me. So, Anya. No. Oh, that makes a really big difference, doesn't it? Sorry about that. So probably not all of you have the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, on your Facebook page so that you get it as part of your feed. Um, I do um, because that's just the kind of person I am. I am also uh, like and follow a blog called <clears throat> shit academics say, um, and, various, and various other social media sites that are uh, kind of uh, specialties for, for academics like myself. Um, but I don't think that you actually have to be geeky enough to have those things in your Facebook feed to know that there is a lot of uh, concern about the future of higher education in this country right now. And um, just to give one example that Wisconsin has made the decision to revise its tenure requirements so that tenured faculty members can be let go if the administration uh, decides that uh, and the Board of Regents there decides that certain uh, fields of inquiry are more relevant, uh, by which they mean more profitable, than other fields. And this, of course, is something that causes great consternation, um, <laughs> not only for faculty in the Wisconsin University system, but uh, around the nation. So I think, uh, I, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have to think very hard about the first question about the most pressing issues uh, faced by humanities is that it seems like there are a lot of people with decision-making power 
who don't think the humanities matter very much and who think that we should be reducing our commitment to the humanities um, and that uh, we should in fact be penalizing students who want to pursue the humanities um, by, for example, uh, not offering them as much financial aid as students who pursue other fields. Uh, this is a real proposal, right, that's, that's out there. Um, so that is, that is a huge source of concern for me and for, and for many others in, in academia. In terms of the solutions, is that where I'm supposed to go with this? Um, I mean, you know, barring the proverbial rich uncle, uh, long lost uncle, and we, I don't think we have enough uncles for this. Um, I really think, um, you know, not to sound overly idealistic about this, but the solution is, is to, well, recognize that the humanities do have value, and it's a value that cannot necessarily be measured in uh, purely monetary terms. Um, and, uh, and I think that that actually leads me into the exciting developments that I uh, thought I would mention. So what I think are some of the most exciting developments in my field in history are new ways of bringing historical research and historical sources to a much wider public, that that is where the field is going now and that I think that has the potential to raise people's awareness about the value of the humanities, not just for those of us who do this full time, right, but, <laughs> um, but for everyone. So uh, as some of you know, um, I've been working with PBS on a new mini-series that's uh, based on Civil War era Alexandria called Mercy Street. And the reason I got involved in this project in the first place was because I saw the possibility of reaching way more people um, by collaborating with PBS than I was ever possibly going to encounter in a classroom. So over the course of 20 years at University of Montana, I've encountered, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of students, but Mercy Street on its first night reached five million viewers. Um, that is an enormous audience, right? And whether those viewers all actually thought about this or not, what that means is they actually just got acquainted with humanities scholarship because that show had not just me, but a whole team of ultimately, I think, 10 different humanists who consulted on the show to bring the sort of most uh, current, most innovative, uh, most exciting research in the social history of the Civil War into a format that was, you know, widely disseminated. And I think that's just one example, it happens to be the one I know the most about, but that's just one example of some really cool things that are happening uh, in uh, history and the others having to do more with making sources more broadly available. So um, I actually just shared with Ashby a couple of days ago, um, news about um, some uh, newly digitized medieval manuscripts, um, which is pretty darn exciting when you consider the uh, <clears throat> rarity and fragility of medieval manuscripts to have the ability to see them and work with them without having to travel across the country and, um, you know, be on site is a really exciting opportunity. There's a new database, a digitized database of slave names in Virginia, uh, so that anybody who knows that they are descended from or had any connection to anyone who was ever a slave in Virginia can now actually search a, uh, you know, a word searchable database of slave names in Virginia. I think that's a really um, exciting development. Um, for Civil War buffs, there's a super cool new website called CSI Dixie that's <laughs> digitized mortuary records from the Civil War South. Um, I think that's very exciting. Um, not everyone may think that that is so exciting, but um, but it really does open up all kinds of interesting avenues to explore um, what, how an earlier generation of Americans dealt with many of the uh, um, illnesses and um, causes of death um, that followed the Civil War that are still with us today, like post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, major depression and suicide, all of which make 
uh, prominent appearance in the digitized records of CSI Dixie, uh, which in addition to everything else has a sexy name. So, um, so I think that the more of that kind of work that is being done and the more people who are being exposed to uh, what it is that humanists do, either by being able to access the sources themselves digitally um, or by being able to enjoy the fruits of those labors in some more artistic form, uh, then more people will have an appreciation for why the humanities matter and are vital and interesting for all of us and, you know, God save us, maybe even sexy. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that it's, uh, we might sh have quite of the same ideas uh, when it comes to the humanities. The real problem and the real challenge is uh, showing the relevance of the humanities. And it's not enough to say as humanists, it's relevant. It has to become relevant to everyone and obvious to everyone that uh, there is relevance in it. And the thing I want to focus on tonight is the question of um, critical analysis and reading, and not just reading books, but reading everything around you and your environment and the people. And I just remember when I started uh, uh, in Paris, when I started working as a researcher, doing my AMED, that's the first time that I worked on a thesis, I remember that the internet didn't really exist at the time. And so I had to work with books, and I had to work with real I had copies of things. And uh, my babysitter last time, actually last week, she told me, can you believe I went to the library last time and there were books, real books, and she was laughing and making fun of the situation. But that's all I had when, uh, when I was a student, a graduate student in Paris. And I remember how often I had to cross the Seine, the river, to go to the American Library of Paris because I was working on uh, American literature, and it was a whole field trip, and I was so excited every time, and it took so long, and now when I think of it, it was so long when um, Ashby talked about patience. Even getting a book required patience, and now you just click, and you can find so many types of information just on the internet, and often I bless the internet because I think, wow, wow, already? Oh, I found the thing. I just Google a quotation. I don't know exactly from which book it comes from. But this is something that um, this uh, affluence of data, of information in the internet is something that is surrounds us, but also overwhelms us. And I think that it's good to talk about uh, the profitability of data and knowledge and accumulation, but what are you supposed to do with it? And I think that's when the humanities come into it, is how to learn how to read those data, how to analyze them. It's a little bit like, it's a weird analogy, but it's a little bit like someone who will uh, win the lottery and suddenly get um, uncontrollable amount of money, but never learn how to, what to do with this money, how to read people, how to invest, how to know what money means. And most, we know that most of the people who become millionaires through the lottery just lose everything. And I think it's the same. It's so crucial to know how to read, analyze, and understand um, the data, the information. That's where profit, uh, profitability comes into play. I think it's through reading, the reading skills. And uh, when it comes to the solution, how to make it relevant, I don't have an answer to that, and I wish I, I, I did. But maybe you're right, Anya, it's to try to make it more sexy to appeal to, and more entertaining to appeal to a new generation, because we know that. We went through that. We had to take the subway to get a book, and we still do. So we do. It's the new generation, and we have to appeal to their way of being attracted to something. Um, and then when it comes to my field, uh, this week was an important week. There is um, a Congolese, a uh, French Congolese writer. His name is Alain Mabancou. And my first year in the, at the University of Montana, I invited him to give a speech about Congolese literature. And it was his first talk in English. And he was very intimidated. You remember? And it, wa it was a big moment because he um, is very visual. When you look at him, he comes from um, what we call in French la sap. It means people, Congolese people who like to look good and invest all their money in 
tailored suits and beautiful leather shoes, and he looked exactly like that. He looked really good. It was the beginning of his career, and um, he was hired at the university. I met him at the University of Michigan when I was a student. He was a visiting a novelist, and he was hired by the University of UCLA. And since then, he kept he has kept climbing and climbing and climbing. And now you can, and I cannot go back to France without seeing him on some sorts of TV channels. He's everywhere, also because he looks good, I think. <laughs> and um, this week, he gave uh, an inaugural speech at the Collège de France, which is the most elite um, research institution in Paris. And he was the first um, novelist but also African and black novelist to be uh, selected as the, as the fellow and to give that speech. And so the, the room was completely full. Everybody was talking about it, and everybody took his pictures. And it was, he got a standing ovation, and he talked about African literature, and he explained how Africans in France, we have a big population of um, African immigration, immigrants have been overlooked and despised and insulted by f the French imperialistic uh, empire, and that he finally sees, finally he understands that we, are, we may be black stains on the book, but we are important black stains that make you understand your own culture. And why am I saying that is because when I moved to America to study uh, Francophone uh, literature, Francophone meaning Caribbean, African, and North African literature, I was very excited to move to America because it didn't exist in, um, in France. France was still about Molière, Sartre, and uh, uh, the typical French continental, it was continental literature. And I remember coming here and this, this whole world opened up to me. And now, finally, France is catching up with um, what makes sense about one's identity, understanding all the peripheral uh, movements of one's identity, and they are catching up with what has been going on for over 15 years, if, uh, maybe 20 years in America. And now, so America is moving forward. It seems like when it comes to Francophone and postcolonial studies, America, the United States is always one step forward, and the new step is intersection, understanding that one field is not whole, and you have to find some intersections and some interdisciplinarity. And this is what is exciting right now. It's not just African-American studies, but it's how African-American studies relate to um, animal studies, for example, or Caribbean studies, or North African studies. And this is where the, my field is going right now. It's really exploding and uh, becoming um, as we say, centrifugal, going in all directions. It might be a mess, but it's an interesting mess. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm going to probably come at it pretty much the same way. I, I think that the humanities, it might be a bit overblown to say that the threat to the humanities is existential, but not all that overblown. And I think I mean, th there's been a fundamental change in, in, in the culture over the last 20, 30 years. And it's a change in which there's a, di there's a fundamentally different conception of rationality. I mean, once upon a time, rationality was understood in a way that you were talking about facilitating the higher powers of the human being in various sorts of ways. And there was a notion of self-realization, of authenticity. There were, there were a variety of perhaps problematic ideals, but ideals nonetheless that served as regulative ideals toward which we ought to strive. And then I would say about 20, 30 years ago, there was a fundamental change in the way in which we began to make sense of ourselves. There was a change in the way that we actually began to reason. And so, I mean, crudely, the term has been bandied about, but the notion of neoliberalism, which came into play about 30, 35 years ago, fundamentally changed the way in which we make sense of things in a very basic way that we frequently don't articulate to ourselves. So, once upon a time, it would be the case that we would think richly about our lives. 
then it became the case, uh, there was a seminal book by a Chicago economist by the name of Gary Becker in 1976 entitled uh, the, the Economic Approach to Human Behavior, which really sort of set the standard for how we ought to think about ourselves. So it, it came to be the case that economics was no longer about macro and micro level problems and inflation and the Phillips curve and all the rest, but it began to dominate the way in which we begin to think about ourselves as rational agents in a certain sense that are utility maximizing. And the deep problem for the humanities to cut to the chase is that when you look at the humanities as a utility maximizing or profit maximizing venture, the humanities is already gone. It doesn't measure up in those sorts of terms. And the deep problem is we tend to think in these terms even when we don't think we're thinking in these terms. There's a very interesting political scientist by the name of Wendy Brown who did a study of a President Obama's talk in 2013 where he had basically had enough of Wall Street and began to put out different sorts of things that we ought to be pursuing here, so, such as clean energy, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, immigration reform, making colleges more affordable and all the rest. And the bottom the bottom line in every one of those was the bottom line. If you go back and look at his talk, everything that he sought to do was justified ultimately by profitability, by revenues, and all the rest. And so in some sense, the speech is, was really quite compelling. But in another sense, if the justification is simply a question of profitability, then really we've lost much more than we can ever begin to realize. And, and so the idea here is, is that the humanities, if, if they need to be justified in this way, the game is already lost in some sense. We need to go back to the humanities and understand the richness of the humanities and justify them, not in terms of how they contribute to the bottom line, unless we understand the bottom line is what the bottom line was for classic liberalism, which gave rise to the humanities, namely the actualization of the field, full human being, him or herself. Um, so I think that in some sense the, 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 the title of the, city, the, the series, Making Sense of Ourselves, captures what's at stake in humanities. But crucially, in order to make sense of ourselves, what do we need to do? We need to know where we've been. We need to know what kinds of beings we are. We need to know where we want to go. And these are the kinds of questions that neither the natural nor the social sciences is capable of answering. In other words, neither scientism, which is the taking of science beyond its appropriate boundaries, whether theoretical or applied, say, through technology, or for that matter, the current economism in which everything is made sense of in terms of economics. At their best, philosophy, history, literature, the fine arts enable us to answer these sorts of questions in a distinctive way. And, these, and answering these sorts of questions are not a luxury in our time in the way in which the humanities are frequently put forth, but are actually essential. And the essentiality go, is, is really quite evident if you just look at the news and what's going on today. Um, I've always thought one of the greatest advertisements for, for, for the humanities was Joseph Goebbels' claim. Goebbels was the Nazi propagandist who had basically utilized um, American advertising methods for, for, the, uh, for the, the Third Reich. And he once said, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. Because in a certain sense, humanities is, is, is a protection against, is a guarding against, is a facilitating of the entire personality in such a, a way that we don't easily capitulate to those sorts of messages that are being put forth by Goebbels in his time or by others in our time, right? The humanities are not simply about a bottom line, but what they need to do is return to understanding ourselves in a much richer sort of way and presenting an alternate paradigm to the paradigm that says that, you know, if anything can justify itself in terms of the bottom line, then it needs to be discarded, which is represented in all sorts of, of phrases. I mean, the one that comes to, line, to mind is the, the, the phrase, you know, money talks and bullshit walks. Well, the notion is, is that the humanities is bullshit by that line, and in a certain sense, that that's right, if you're going to define it in those terms. So what the humanities needs to do, and I'm not saying I know how to do this or anyone else for that matter, but the, what the humanities needs to do is 
take the story and, and, and give it the, the axial turn and say, look, what this has always been about is rich, living a richer sort of life rather than simply looking to monetize every aspect of our, of our lives and our personalities and understand ourselves as little bundles of capital going out in the world looking to maximize our, 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 our fortunes and make ourselves look good for other people. It's the humanities that speaks against all of this. So, what's the most promising and exciting new developments in philosophy? Well, I mean, I, I work in, in value theory, and, and I think one of the most interesting areas that's been opened up in, in value theory is that we, we've opened up to uh, the sciences in a much richer way. There's always been a part of philosophy, I think, that's gone too far in opening itself up to the sciences, and so there are certain philosophers of science that think that philosophy itself is only justified insofar as it could be put on the same foundations as the natural sciences. It seems to me that this is a mistake, but for reasons I obviously don't have the time to go into. But I think in another sense, philosophy is always understood as the meta-level discipline. Once upon a time with the ancients, all there was was philosophy. And as time has gone on, the, the, the natural sciences spun out as philosophy, the human sciences spun out of philosophy. Literally, as, as little as a couple of hundred years ago, there was no psychology or sociology. It was philosophy. Nietzsche was the first great psychologist. I mean, it wasn't until the, the, later part, the latter part of the 1800s where sociology actually gets his legs. And so there, there's always been this concern in philosophy, well, what is left to us? For the philosopher, what is left is the sort of meta-level perspective that makes sense of what's going on in the human sciences, make sense of what's going on in the natural sciences. And the exciting thing is, is that it's now the case that people are starting to actually open up to the social sciences. I look at the social sciences all the time to see what's going on in, in, in terms of, and, and, and in biology and all these other areas, because to make sense of ourselves as moral beings, we need to make sense of ourselves in the full context, and that goes beyond our history, our literature, and our culture, which is essential, but opening up and, and synthesizing and mediating our relationship to, to the sciences as well. So as a friend of mine once put it in an article, pretty much gone to the days where anyone who was a philosopher would carry the proceedings from some you know, scientific journal in a brown paper bag into their department. We can now actually carry the science into the department. And I think that's one, that's one of the most exciting areas that's opened up in philosophy. But at the end of the day, philosophy's distinctive contribution, as far as I'm concerned, is when we try and get clear on social, moral, and political question, it's necessary for us to open up to the disciplines, but to never forget basically what we are, which is bringing a kind of meta-level per perspective that, that reflects on the results of all of these other areas, as well as history and culture, and, and then to to more wisely determine what Socrates and more recently the great moral philosopher Bernard Williams were concerned with. How should one live? And I think that's something that philosophy is concerned with, and it's something unique to the humanities. That's a great question. Um, I think that we are profoundly uncomfortable not having answers. <laughs> I think we want answers. Everybody does. It's, it's in the title. Making sense of ourselves, answers. Answers are so great. And I would say that the problem with humanities is that it doesn't give us answers, actually. It, it, it asks more questions. And, and that is, tr it's hard. It's a, it's a living in a place of conflict and it's living in a place of um, doubt and um, not understanding one's identity or not understanding why we do the things we do. And so it's painful and it's way easier just to have an answer. <laughs> and so we, we go to these disciplines where we can have a, one specific answer that is comforting and makes us feel good about the choices that we've made and who we are and what's happening with our world. It's a sense of order that it gives us. Um, and I see, it, I see it in my students. I'd love to believe that, that young students are, are more comfortable with you know, unease, but I don't think they are. When sometimes I'll catch myself you know, giving, them, giving them a piece of information and, and, and they're not comfortable that, that it doesn't have a nice neat bow or package around it. 
And sometimes I'm not comfortable with that either. I'm, I think that's actually why I'm drawn to this field because I am continually seeking an answer. So, but, but it just poses more questions for me. So, I, I mean, I, it is a good question. I, I love it. I thought, I thought a lot about it and, and I would love, I would love to place the blame on, on, on something, but I think we're just, I, I think we're uncomfortable with it. And maybe now in this climate where, you know, economics or, or uh, money and profit is, is a need for a lot of people, um, maybe it's a little worse than it has been, but I think it's probably always been this way. Um, the answer that I have is the answer. The answer that I have on how to deal with this actually is I kind of, I've, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with it because it kind of puts some onus on me and it's something that I fought against a lot actually. I would say that we, we need to figure out how to articulate why the humanities are important in a more clear way. And I think we need to articulate that to our students. I know we need to articulate that to our parents. And we have to learn how to articulate that to administrators. Um, and we don't want to because we're pissed off that we have to. <laughs> and we just want to keep asking these questions, right? But we've got to, we've got to figure out a way to say, I've got to figure out a way to say to a sophomore in high school, this is why you should consider coming to the university and majoring in theater. This is why, exactly why. This is what you're going to get out of it. And I'm trying to articulate that and it's, it's hard. It's, it's, been, it's taken me several years and I've avoided actually this for a long time, but um, I think we need to learn how to do that in a very um, clear way. So that's, that's my tiny little solution, which puts it back on me and all of us. But there are a lot of really exciting things that are happening, I think, in, in, in the arts and in theater. And my area is working really with um, a lot of non-actors and, and demonstrating with non-actors why this is a, a viable, interesting field. And two of the examples that I can think of right off the bat, one is international, and it's the work that's being done by several organizations in Gaza and in Jerusalem around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And there, there are a couple theater groups that have brought both Palestines and Israeli people together to create plays. And they're not about solutions, <coughs> and they're not about agreeing, but they're actually about, we don't agree, but let's, let's create a, a performance about that, and then performing it. Um, and then there, there are other groups who are not necessarily theater practitioners, but they're there, there actually is an incredible organization of um, veterans from um, Israel and Palestine who, who are coming together. And they've actually found that theater is a really great way to share each other's stories and to step into the shoes of the opposite and then to say that language and perform that identity. And as I talked about last week, perhaps have a tiny, tiny glimpse into what it might be like to live in that person's self for a while. So that's really exciting. And I'll be on sabbatical next year in the Middle East, and that's something that I'm really looking forward to um, learning more about and perhaps even um, working with. Um, and then there's just another really cool local project, which I don't know how many of you know about, but it's called Spark. And it's a Kennedy Center, um, Washington, D.C., John F. Kennedy Center initiative. They've chosen 11 communities in the United States, and Missoula is one of them. And part of that is thanks to Phyllis Washington, who, is, who sits on that, or, um, on that board. Um, but what it is doing is it's, um, it's providing funds to give to artists to go into K through 12 public classrooms to work with students and to model for teachers 
ways that the arts, dance and drama and media arts and visual arts and music can be used to teach discrete academic subjects. So it's focusing on academic subjects and I love that. So how can I use, how can I work with a classroom to use drama to teach the parts of speech or drama to teach the states of matter? And um, I think that's really an exciting, it's, a, it's, going, it's been in existence all year. We've, we're sort of figuring it out and then next year we're really piloting the project. So that's a, a cool local thing that's going on. All right, I would like to add um, one thing to, um, is it Anya? Anya. Yeah, Anya's um, discussion earlier about the humanities. It's not just a problem in North America, but I think it's also a global issue. Whenever I tell people whether they are American or Vietnamese or Asian that I'm doing English, look at me like, what? Are you, are you okay? Are you, you know what I mean, what? So they gave me that kind of question because they assume that as an Asian, you should be a geek, a nerd, an IT expert, an engineer, a medical doctor, a scientist, an English professor. And they look at me like that weird thing. And in my culture, is it believe this, you must be really dumb to do the humanities. <laughs> because you cannot do math, you cannot do chemistry, then you do like English, philosophy, sociology, because that's the, like the dead end that you can you know, go into. So, um, so my mom keeps telling me that, you know, why don't you do something more interesting? And, and if you go to google.com and you type in, you know, why a PhD in English is worthless, there will be a whole bunch of links, and it will tell you why it's a worthless degree. Um, when I got into the grad school in Texas, um, the first day orientation, I would tell this. To the whole audience, the uh, advisor said, um, now, are you serious about pursuing this degree? If you are not serious, you still have time to change your mind. Because you realize that after you get your degree, you probably don't have any money. Nobody will hire you. You will be a hamburger seller, whatsoever you call it. Um, so kind of depressing in a way. And um, <laughs> when I applied for a job at UM, it was for multi-ethnic American-led. And if I remember correctly, we received about 200 applications. UT Austin applied, I'm sorry, advertised for a job in uh, more than American-led. They received that year 800 applications. So we say that we only have one piece of cake, but there are too many flies. <laughs> That's the uh, Vietnamese uh, way of saying it. And even the U.S. government is kind of biased against the humanities because if you are a foreigner and you want to get a green card and work here, you have to do the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. So if you, are, you, know, you have a degree in STEM, then your green card process will be quicker and faster. But if you have a degree in like, philosophy, Gosh, no, it takes you forever and you may have to get deported back to your country <laughs> because we don't need you here. <laughs> um, so those are just a few things that you uh, can see um, about the bias against the humanities. And the reason I do English Lit, and I'm sorry, American Lit is this. When I first came to America, I thought about doing ESL or linguistics because I thought that it was more approachable for me. And then my professor said, no, because linguistic is very boring, according to his or her bias perspective. You learn lit because you learn about the history of America, the philosophy, way of life, way of thinking, uh, religion, all of those things, and it's all in literature. If you do linguistic, it's all you know, grammar, morphology, phonology, it's too boring. And you are not an intellectual if you do linguistics. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> um, but I said, well, I don't care about living in the US. I want to return to Vietnam after I get my degree. He said, no, you're going to stay here. <laughs> and the Vietnamese said, get a degree in America, go to Vietnam, be a king, and make us a lot of money. Why do you want to live here? So I still have that challenge nowadays. Uh, my friends who got a degree in the US going back and make, you know, let's say, $5,000 a month teaching in Vietnam. And they said, why do you have to be in the US? Because with a degree from this country, you can go there, you know, go back and be a king. Um, so I think there's a lot of challenges for the humanities with all the bias, discrimination, and I would call stereotypes. One day I was in the library, and I look like a student if I, you know, from my personal arrogant point of view. 
there was a white student and I got, I didn't know who he was. He came to me and said, hey, hey bro, uh, can you help me with a math problem? And I said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, excuse me? And he said, oh, I thought you Asian, you know math, man. I mean, all Asian are good at math. You don't know math? And I said, no, I'm an English professor. I said, oh, that's weird, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell that, you know, people often expect you to be a scientist, you know, like an engineer, and not an English professor or, you know, a literary critic. And uh, you can see that I have to face the stereotype on a daily basis, either in the library or in my country and in my culture. <clears throat> All right, the chal uh, so let's talk about these problems and the solutions. This semester, I'm teaching intro to lit for the first time in my life. And most of my students are non-English majors. On the first day of class, I ask them, why are you taking the course? Well, it's a requirement. I have no choice. And, you know, it's not free will. It's fate predestination <laughs> and they gave me this weird look because you know it was like they were forced into the classroom and I <clears throat> I told them that um, well I hope you learn something from the course and I said well I'm not sure you know this course kind of you know scared me to death you know I haven't read a book for five years or you know I've written an essay for like three years and my business major wants me to take the course to improve my writing and I said well you realize that this course is important because when you get, <clears throat> when you send out your letter of application for a job, it has to be um, flawless. If you have a, an error, then they probably look at you like, huh, you probably cannot write English and you won't get a job. And they just don't believe me. They said, well, you know, my grandmother or my mom is, you know, is, is a professor and, you know, she'll help me, help me with the English editing. I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> so there's a lot of issues here that my students nowadays, um, are struggling with. They think that a degree in humanities is worthless and there's no monetary value after they get the, the degree. So they only want to do you know, business and engineering and uh, it's a challenge even for the professor. And it's hard for them to um, realize that writing and speaking and the ability to artic articulate effectively in daily lives are the key uh, to success. And they don't see that. Um, so. It's just some anecdotes for you to uh, think about. Thank you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite a few flies, but I hope, uh, <coughs> I hope there are some more flies out there. Um, that was our, our thought. Would we throw it up to the floor? Uh, comments, questions, curiosities? I know uh, some of you have talked to some of the speakers after uh, each talk, but if you had Questions to any of us about the topic today or about past lectures, this would be the time. And I guess the microphone's going to come around. First of all, thank you all for making the career choices you made. <laughs> 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 this has been very enjoyable, and I, I very much appreciate it. One of the uh, greatest gifts in my life occurred at the University of Montana in 1973 when I was able to complete a year of study with um, Dr. Henry Bugby in the humanities program. And touching on Jillian's observation about questions, the gift that um, Henry gave me and the rest of the students in that class was the gift of the question, what does it mean to be a man or a woman? And that is, it seems to me, the, the hinge point of the humanities. And it is the ultimate justification for the humanities, regardless of whatever discipline a student may follow here at the University of Montana. It doesn't matter if you're in business or STEM or, or anything. If you don't hold that question and, and have the ability to throughout your life reflect on that question, it will never be answered. Maybe at the moment of fading flesh when, when a person dies, you kind of get it. But until then, it's a question that can be your friend. It can take you through your life. It's something that those moments of reflection are the ones that are the richest. So. 
I'm not afraid of the question, and I, and I think that's the answer, is, is that you have to help all the students embrace that question. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this lecture series, but the, I had a little trouble getting into it at the beginning, and then I thought this was maybe one of the more interesting things to me, is the way you all lecture is vastly different than the way that the ornithology department people, the way they structure their lecture, and the way you get from the beginning point of it to the end of the point. And, they, and yours all seems to be like a common thought process. And I think it's creative thinking instead of problem solving thinking. And I'm thinking that maybe that might be one of your strong points, which is uh, besides having the like, historical and cultural backgrounds to ask a question, I think maybe even the people who are scientists, to be truly great and come up with great theories, they're using your kind of thinking um, to find questions that are even worth asking. Mm -hmm. that, and if you have any comments, that's fine. Or maybe it's just my <laughs> take on it. Do any of you want to comment on that? She, I mean, you may be revealing something interesting. I'd love to hear you follow up on what you've found in common about the thought processes or the, or the, the mode of presenting the material. I mean, I, I would say I did see something in that. Uh, it would be something like, yeah, exactly. I was, exactly, I was about to do that. I was about to say, present a problem, walk through possible solutions, walk your audience through methodology, and then bring it back together in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a storytelling component and there's a sort of schematic structural component and that's what kind of why I fixated on David's diagrams, you know, because he hung a lot off of that diagram. Um, it's a, actually a quite creative um, uh, device for thinking um, that he's come up with. Um, and I'm really interested in that kind of question about how people think and how they structure their thought processes when they, when they present. But that's why I was curious to have you follow up, is I, I wonder if you're telling us something that we maybe don't know about ourselves, <laughs> you know, in, in, in that, that, especially that sort of paradigm of, of the journey or the circle that, we, I, and I think there was something to that in all of the talks in some ways. Present a problem and then walk through a journey to arrive, you know, to pass through the stations before arriving back at the problem again with a richer sense of what it means. In other words, not an answer, Jillian, right, but a, but a richer version of the problem. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. I, Um, I just want to comment on Jillian's comment that people often know what to do but don't do it because they're pissed off. They're sorry that they have to do it. And I want to refer back to Marjorie, Is it not on? to Marjorie Garber, who spoke in the President's Lecture Series last fall and said, who's better prepared to talk than a humanities professor? Yeah. <laughs> Get out there. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so we are sending our students out to do the same thing. Uh, all of us tell stories in different ways. Uh, different people will hear different people. Every story is going to affect a different person. I think sheer volume um, if we all just get after it. But I certainly understand being really irritated to have to make the case. <laughs> but nonetheless. <laughs> well, I think you're right, Lori. I think, I think it's um, marketing. I, I don't want to market my ideas or myself or my, but I, I, I'm feeling more and more that I have to, and I'm really resisting that, but I'm starting to realize that that's not doing anybody any good, so do it anyway and then move on and, and, and yeah, so marketing to the students, to their parents, and to administrators.
Yeah, and part of it's finding a platform, and Anya found a platform, and, and, it's, and it's a fantastic platform for her thinking and her ideas, and f f part of it, I think, is the creativity of trying to invent those new platforms, whatever they might be, whether it's social media or whether it's, um, I mean, you know, venues like this are fantastic, right? Here we are talking, but, um, but you know, continuing to reinvent those, those uh, platforms in which we can kind of dialogue with, with the public. I think the idea of the public intellectual um, has has become so attenuated that we are, we have a sort of hard time even knowing where to start to change that paradigm again. Um, yeah. And so I think there are some ways too in which being in academia can, can kind of hamstring us as well. I mean, again, I follow a kind of quirky list of, of. Uh, websites uh, on on Facebook, but I get a lot of posts uh, about academics learning to write for non-academics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and various tips on <laughs> what we're doing wrong and how we might improve our writing and be, write in a more accessible manner that non-academics would be interested in, which is marvelous, but is also a luxury for those of us who are attempting to uh, achieve our our uh, unit standards for tenure uh, <laughs> or for advancement and promotion uh, because, of course, uh, we are generally speaking, and I don't mean here at UM, I mean really like in academia, we are generally speaking uh, not particularly rewarded <laughs> for, uh, you know, giving giving talks uh, at, at community events, say, as opposed to publishing in a major journal. But to publish in that journal, you train yourself to write in a way that is anything but accessible and engaging to an ordinary person. Um, so so there's, a, there's some tension built in, right, that in order to think of ourselves as intellectuals, we have to publish in these academic journals that require us to study more and more obscure and arcane topics and frame them in more and more complicated and, and, and complex ways. And so in order to succeed, we are, as individuals in academia, we are then dooming the academic study of, hu of the humanities in a broader sense and how exactly to deal with that problem is a little puzzling for me. I mean, for me, my, my own thinking is, okay, well, um, I'm, I'm fairly, you know, I, I've jumped most of those hurdles now, so I don't have to worry about the academic, uh, yeah. <laughs> about the academic side of things, um, I, and I can, you know, I can be more creative, and I can do, I can devote more time and attention to, okay, now that I have acquired all of this, all of this um, knowledge and know how to get more, now how can I translate it? But I don't think that the way that we structure the academic tenure ladder and promotion ladder is particularly well suited to that kind of, uh, you know, more, you know, letting people know the wide array of things that humanists in this instance do um, when many, when most of us are still trying to prove ourselves to an entirely different audience of people. H have any of you flirted with, um, you know, creative projects and different, v I mean, well, take Jillian, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, Joe. But the other, I mean, taking your book and your work to a broader audience or, or thinking about different kinds of delivery of your academic research. <laughs> no? Somehow we do, even um, just by being teachers. Yeah. I think what you do when you teach, your field is bringing it down to the common denominator and yeah. to make it accessible to all. Yeah. So I think we are kind of multilingual. We have a different language when we write in academic journals, and we have a different language when we teach or when we talk to our friends about what we do or when we talk, talk to a colleague. Yeah. It's all different. Yeah. And that's what we do. We learn to navigate mm -hmm. uh, this complexity and the differences in language. Yeah. And I think you can make a big mistake um, in imagining a public audience that's um, yeah, dumbing, dumbing your work down or because you miss that part of what we ought to be doing is actually elevating public discourse. In other words, part of what we ought to be doing is bringing a more eloquent, higher order 
thinking to the public. Um, and I have friends in, in medieval studies that are writing novels. They think now that the novel is a better delivery mechanism for their research. These are, you know, um, meticulously researched literary novels set in 14th century England, you know, featuring Chaucer and Gower as characters. But, and so they think that's a great delivery mechanism because now maybe a bigger audience of people will pick my, my book up and, and see some of my thought process and then maybe be curious enough to, to follow it along. I mean, I'm experimenting a little this semester with some, because uh, I, I think going back to the technology question, technology has lowered the bar, like the cost of of putting your work out there is extremely low, right? I mean, we, we can all we could all be blogging every day, right? If we wanted to, um, and um, so I'm experimenting with some of my students in uh, the One Button Studio over on on campus, and we're going to create some videos on uh, as part of a creative response to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales this year, and kind of see where it goes. And as I, so I'm eager to kind of move in that direction a little bit more, where it's kind of combining the teaching and then also a public platform where you can kind of deliver it out. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. I, I, my, this little part of my brain that hides most of the time is thrilled to be coming here one night a week, hearing language that I haven't heard for a long time and <laughs> thinking thoughts that have eluded me for a lot of years. Uh, so thank you. And wh one of the things I was thinking about tonight is remembering my grandparents talking about Chautauqua which was um, a travel, I don't have any idea how it worked. What I know is they, at their age, I don't know, they were still remembering it. They were still talking about going to hear so-and-so at Chautauqua, whatever that is. And that's what I thought of you tonight. You're just pre-Chautauqua, I think. <laughs> I love that. Um, a friend of mine in the School of Music, Nancy Cooper, actually uh, is working on a project on a, an early woman musician who was on the Chautauqua circuit. So because she and I are in a writer's group together, I have had the opportunity to learn a lot more about Chautauqua <laughs> in the last couple of years. And there's this great quote about Chautauqua being a, a combination of, uh, of, you know, a, of uh, a conservatory and a uh, a, a county fair where you can, you know, you can hear great or orations and you can, you know, judge pigs uh, in the same place. So, yeah, I mean, Chautauquas were amazing. The program went from the mid-19th century until about 1920 um, in most places and, and was basically this kind of traveling variety show except that the performers were artists and scholars and, and rhetoricians and activists. So you would have, uh, on the same platform, you would have a concert pianist, uh, you would have a speaker for some kind of cause, Jeanette Rankin, for instance, uh, was on the Chautauqua circuit. Um, you would have uh, somebody doing uh, dramatic readings from plays, uh, and you know, and then I don't know, like a juggling act. Um, <laughs> but it was like it was like a cultural circus. Uh, really interesting, uh, really interesting phenomenon. It's uh, the the scholarly explanation for the decline of Chautauqua is the rise of the radio. Uh, but, <laughs> but wouldn't it be great to bring it back? I think it would be fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to uh, tie something Ashby said with uh, something Professor Campana said earlier about uh, the level of political discourse or public discourse and the, the notion that humanities doesn't yield uh, answers. It, 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 it yields ambiguities. That, Excellent lecture last night by Professor, Professor Hoffman, the Nobel chemist who also is a playwright and poet, also identified ambiguity as a positive attribute of the humanities that, that is not uh, where it's a disadvantage is in the science. When ambiguity is removed in the sciences, progress is made, but ambiguity is helpful in, in the humanities. And it makes me wonder if there's a correlation in the, with this uh, perceived 
drift away from the humanities over the last couple of decades with an increase in political polarization in the sense that that people see one answer and 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 don't uh, and don't see other points of view and, and and so forth i'm not saying it's just people one way or the other on the, on the political spectrum but it it, it shifts them to the to the boundaries any, any comments on that? Yeah, I actually quite agree. I mean, th there's a phrase called ticket thinking, which is in some sense it's almost a, a sort of Pavlovian response when all you hear a certain, you know, certain words are uttered and all of a sudden you sort of click in and you haven't really thought about the problem. A number of people have raised a question about questions. And the one thing I, I would point out, I mean, I think in all of the humanities, certainly in, in philosophy, but I think in literature and, and history, and there's a sort of hermeneutical process whereby what every generation does is it poses these questions anew. But I, I think it's important to point out that we don't just want to sort of privilege ambiguity for its own sake. So, for example, I, one of the things I'll teach every so often is introduction to ethics, and I'll begin uh, my, the class with a sort of a Kantian problematic and a utilitarian problematic. These are different problematics for, for Kantians, for deontologists. The emphasis is on the rightness or wrongness of an act, full stop. Whereas for the utilitarians, the emphasis is upon the consequences. And you can immediately tell a story where you find the Kantian, the, the Kantian moves utterly objectionable. For example, you can't lie to the Nazi in order to facilitate really good ends on a deontological story. On a consequentialist story, there are certain sorts of utility maximizing ends that we would find abhorrent. And my class looks at me and says, well, what, 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 why is this worthwhile? Where's the answer? And it's, I tell them, I can't give you an answer here, but insofar as you understand the way in which important thinkers have approached the problem and the different standpoints, to the extent that we're talking about a remaining ambiguity, the ambiguity arises after an enriching process in which you can pose the question and the problem in a much more sophisticated sort of way and come up with better answers, even if only provisional to these problems. So I think the, recognizing the ambiguity or the tentative nature of certain the, these answers is important. On the other hand, I don't want to sort of privilege ambiguity as such. But you're 100% you're right insofar as the movement off ambiguity too quickly to certitudes is precisely what gives rise to all the sorts of problems we're observing today. Um. In the Molly class that I took earlier this year, uh, Dr. Silstad repeatedly mentioned or emphasized how uh, important to Einstein creativity was. That he uh, very often just raved, you know, emphasized that that was a very important thing, part of his using his math and all of his other brilliant mind, but if he didn't have the creativity, he wouldn't have come across some of the things that he did possibly. I wanted to pose one question, but I first want to thank you, all of you, for the wonderful presentations you've made. They've been really thought-provoking. Um, and what I'm thinking of is if you look around the room, look at the average age in here. Um, most of us are here because we do believe the humanities are important. We want to hear what the latest is that's going on. Um, what you notice if you look at what's going on in science is there's a lot of resources being put into getting scientists out into the community to talk to young folks and to capture their um, passion, their excitement early. And um, I know the College of Visual Performing Arts does a lot of that. It just occurs to me that, it, you know, we have to do more of that. We have to um, we have to reach lower to kids when they're they're they haven't become jaded yet, and they haven't become enamored of the economy, and they're still open to excitement. And uh, that's maybe maybe a practical way we could think about taking some of the good things on this campus and getting them out into the community, but intentionally going after um, younger kids who are still trying to decide what they want to do with their lives. I had a, a professor, a very fine scholar, who would occasionally introduce a unit and say, now during this unit, 
we're not going to compete. We're going to cooperate and collaborate <laughs> to find the finest ends, to find the greatest utility, if you like, the most value. And I resented her forming the discussion that way because I have been raised to be competitive, I suppose. And it, I find it um, interesting, and I'm only going to make this as an observation, and if you'd like to comment on it, that'd be great. I think what's happening here right now in this, in this discussion is competition as, at its basis level. We are trying to compete for the attention of the population, and like this gentleman ahead of me said, everybody in this room, I mean, we're the choir. Right? Where if you're preaching, you're preaching to the choir. We're believers already. And if we want to have other people believe or other people understand the value of the thought systems that are involved in the humanities, we need to compete for that. So, um, Professor Campana said she resents the marketing and the sales stuff, which I think is the most base, not base in the negative sense, but the basest type of competition. We need to get the attention of people whose attention is drawn by their phones and by their various media. Um, I, I just want to say that one other thing, there's a current musical, historical Broadway show called Hamilton. And I think that, um, I can't say the guy's, the creator's name, I think that he has found a way to compete for the attention of people that is at least temporarily a fabulously winning formula. Um, it's creative and it's entertaining and it's insightful and it's informative and it's all that stuff. So anyway, if you'd like to comment, comment on that or just um, competition, and it's I think. sexy. Well, right. It is. I think competition is a natural <laughs> force like gravity. Yeah. You can't say that you're not going to compete. You yeah, well, and so. I think competing is a, is a great thing. It's working actually with another person, and working alongside them. I think competing is actually very similar to collaborating. Anyone who's ever competed against someone, you know, in, in an athletic playing field, you do have a great reverence for the other players and, and for the, the person that is sort of your antithesis and you respect them and you're working. The better they are, the better you get. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a beautiful thing. And, I was um, going to make a very yeah. similar analogy, and I see you nodding vigorously too. That I think intellectual competition is the heart of a great classroom. I mean, I think some of the best discussions I've seen are kind of they're. I mean, you know, I don't like to see competition and collaboration posed as poles. I guess is what I'm getting at. And if competition is a force of gravity, like gravity, um, I'm glad that there are athletes that try to defy gravity. You know, Michael Jordan. No, he, he, he tried to fight against gravity. I kind of like that. He, he, did, um, he did a good job. He did a pretty good job about it. So, so I mean, yeah, I think there's there's something about um, being in a community of of individuals who all share a passion and confirm and affirm that passion in the discussion. But that can lead to some fairly vigorous disagreement, you know. And and but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's that's part and parcel of the work we do. Well, actually, I'd like to follow up on it as well. I think you need to make sense of competition in different contexts. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm completely with you. I grew up on, you know, the basketball courts and the Brooklyn schoolyards, and you would be bloodied all the time. And, and, and in fact, my wife asked me one time with, with a close friend of ours who would actually introduce us where we would be bruised up after we played. How could you tolerate this? And how can you like each other after this process? And I said, because that's just the nature of the process. But, but there are two ways to make sense of this, and I think it's important, and this gets at what I was saying earlier. Um, there's a kind of competition that's embedded in an array of social practices that seeks to facilitate some sort of higher good. And so when Adam Smith, for example, would be writing in The Wealth of Nations, and he would talk about the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, and by the competition, everybody is better off. One of the interesting things that, for example, the go-go crowd on Wall Street doesn't recognize is Adam Smith's invisible hand and his privileging of competition had nothing to do with what they're talking about. And, and the reason is this. 
When, when Smith talked about competition, he always understood it as being embedded in a particular set of social, cultural, and historical practices, and that those practices would mold it in a way such as to basically maximize the best that comes from competition. The problem with competition as, as it's evolved and as it's played out within our economic sphere today is the fact that there's no longer a recognition that the economy or competition is embedded in a larger set of practices. And in a certain sort of way, that notion of competition has acted as a kind of acid bath, which has destroyed the larger framework, which has held together competition and make it a positive force so that it's, such that it's now become a negative force whereby Competition is to really destroy the other, and ultimately it's destructive of the social fabric that's its condition of possibility. So it depends on how you want to make sense of competition. In, in one I think, sense, I think you're absolutely right. But in another sense, if you're talking in terms of competition and the way that it plays out today, there are deep problems with it because it doesn't understand its own necessary conditions. Um, I like the word competition that you mentioned. I think in my teaching, I want my students to compete with themselves. And that means their own prejudice, their own ignorance, um, bias, but also wrong assumptions about certain things. And I think that is the most important competition that they can um, make in the classroom to raise awareness instead of having like uh, an antithesis, uh, competing with, the them with themselves. Thank you. But also just, I guess, to address the other part of that, which is competing for the attention of the public. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, I feel like um, part of what we need to continually reassert is attention span lengthening uh, activities, act activities that, that lengthen and protract experience, slow the world down, um, and allow those patient ideas that only come from slow excavation to unfold. And I think, um, I don't, so I guess I don't want to compete for attention in that, in that way that um, you know, that, that advertising and music and, and popular culture compete for attention because the attention that they're competing for is, is measurable in very small quanta. And I think the kinds of attention that what we're talking about requires uh, is, is not conducted that way. Um, it's closer to the way we court people that we love than it is, um, you know, to going and sitting in a, in a theater, as great as Hamilton evidently is. Um, read a book on Hamilton. Uh, there's a lot of them, uh, you know, and they're good ones. And, uh, you'll, and you'll absorb more slowly and fully, uh, you know, and, and, if, and if the play Hamilton leads to that result, that's fantastic. But um, if it gives you that sort of false sense of pleasure that comes from eating high calorie food, uh, then, you know, maybe it's not that great. Um, you know, maybe that's not the thing we should emphasize. No, I'm going to keep fighting gravity. <laughs> Great. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep <laughs> fighting gravity. One more question and then it will be time for us to go to the park. Oh. <laughs> I'm so close I don't really need this. Um This may seem like an odd question. <clears throat> it seems to me, it's actually it's a statement. It seems to me that a liberal arts college, university, should expose all their students to the humanities. Why isn't it required? Well, I guess technically it is. I mean, you know, we have a general education program, you know, that, that requires students to take, you know, an array of classics in ethics and in history and in um, literary and artistic studies and I'm missing a global and indigenous perspectives, ethics, American and European, American and European perspectives. There, so there's a group of perspectives that kind of expose students, you know, to that. But that's a lot. Uh, are all those required? They're, yeah, they you're required to take them at a at some level, you know, either at the introductory level or, or at the advanced level. I've been saying for a long time um, that I think the bigger issue is actually the problem of just mere exposure. Right. Um, I'd like to see students structure and and build and develop ideas over multiple years um, so, so that, you know, they're, they're taking one genetic course in their first year and another one in their second and another one in their third and another one in their fourth so that we're not 
producing this model where the gen eds are this thing that you get done and then you get to the real heart of your education so that they run parallel and they're integrated a little bit more deeply um, together. And I, I think that would benefit everyone. Um, I think the teaching would be more interesting and I think the students would get more out of that intellectually. But it's the model we have. The model we have is the one we have. It's, it's kind of a menu buffet approach. Um, you know. And I know we have to go, but to complicate matters further, I have to bring it up because, because enrollment is such an issue for everybody and it has been for a while. Everybody wants gen eds because it's the bread and butter. So, you know, the gen eds that, that were expressive arts are now, they're across campus. You can take an expressive art in many, many disciplines. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be a discipline that is considered the arts. And same with ethics. I mean, in theater, we're, we're thinking about, okay, well, let's propose an ethics course. But if a theater major takes an ethics course in theater and all of their other gen eds in theater, then what exposure is that? But yeah. it leads us back to the issue of the problem of, of, of money and enrollment and the well, ultimate goal. I think, goals. I think the Lots problem is sure. exposure. Yeah. yeah. I just don't think they have enough exposure. And I think you're right about it being slow and that you're fighting a real battle there because everything is fast. Well, in my gen ed courses, I say this in particular, but I say it in a lot of my courses that um, the best teaching that I do and that, that happens in my classroom is a little time bomb that starts ticking, and I don't actually know when it's going to go off. It might, it's probably not going to go off in the 15 weeks of the semester. It might take next semester or the following year or four or five years, and I'm sure everyone up here has gotten that email from a student sometimes a year or two years or five years later saying, you know, I hated your course, and now I can't imagine not having taken it. And so enough of us have that experience that we sort of say, huh, there's something to the way we teach that's a little different. There's a, we, we you know, we wind them up. We, you know, we, we, you know, we add a little grain into the machine, and um, it's not all, always clear where that's going to go. It's not, it's not like the outcomes are not the same as math and science, where at the end of the semester you take that, class, that test and it shows you mastered the concepts. Um, some of our concepts take a long time to master, 40, 50, 60 years, life, you know, uh, maybe they're never mastered. Um, so that's why I keep stressing that time and patience are such, they're just built into what we do. It's recursive. Um, and it's not, and it's additive and accumulative. It's not, it's not an input output model. Um, it well, just let's isn't. recur to it, shall we? <laughs> in the other room. Thank you very much, Thank all you. of you. It's been wonderful.